So as we look at Luke chapter 10, uh, verses 21 to 24, and as we think about the episode that we just watched, as Jesus interacts with these children, um, how do you think the episode helps to reveal the truth of these words? And how do we see Jesus delivering faith to the children in this episode? Um, how do these words apply to us today? What are these words in the episode, I suppose, probably more than anything else, teaching us about humility um, within life in Christ? What do you think? What are you seeing, hearing, remembering? He's teaching the kids without them realizing. There's aspects to that that are certainly true. Yep. We don't always know the lessons that we're learning until after the fact. Um, one of my favorite sermons that I've ever listened to um, is actually not by a Lutheran preacher, uh, Baptist of some nature, and he looks at this idea of memory and how memory is so critical to learning um, and how the disciples actually didn't know who Jesus really was until they actually like looked back on it, right? And especially on the road to Emmaus is what he's looking at. But he, he, the whole sermon, he kind of keeps going back to this, you don't know, right, in that Southern Baptist trying, right? You don't know. You don't know what's working and what's not. You don't know. You don't know what you need until even like after the fact, right? And so I, I think there's definitely truth to that. Fred Craddock, by the way. Really good preacher. Really good preacher. Obviously, theologically wrong on some things, but that's okay. <laughs> what else do you see? I, I, I suppose, let's just say this. Like, what's, the, what's Jesus' point here? What's he trying to tell us? He was trying to say that you uh, keep your, the mind of a child when you hope others to get yep. the, here, that same yep. I guess. This idea of like faith like a child, yep, and we'll look at that especially in Matthew 18 um, when, when we get there. That, that's part of it too, right, that he's saying, hey, there's something about how um, children, right, something about how children learn and embrace the faith uh, that we as adults need to recognize. And again, we'll look at that a little bit more in Matthew 18 as well. Yeah, they all knew the Shema, yep. And, and when you look at that, um, that Shema that they recite in the episode, that is, that was the equivalent for us of like John 3.16, right? So like one of the first verses we'll teach our kids is John 3.16, right? Um, easy to remember, gospel in a nutshell. Uh, for ancient Israel, that great Shema from Deuteronomy chapter 6, um, verse 4 and following, that was kind of their version of John 3.16. It's what they would learn. It was one of the first prayers they would learn, first thing they would learn how to say, and they would recite it um, because God commanded them to, and they took that seriously. Was Jesus teaching them the Lord's Prayer? Did they not know that? No, they would not have known that. Um, that's probably the only thing that I really take exception with in this episode. Uh, like I said, none of this happened, right? This is all... Um, the, the show creator's kind of depiction of what would happen if Jesus ran into these six kids outside of Capernaum, right? Like, how, how would he interact with them? And I think they're spot on. Um, he did not teach them the Lord's Prayer. I am very firm on that uh, because we know when he teaches the Lord's Prayer, right? The disciples come to him, and we'll actually see that in, in The Chosen as well. The disciples come to him and they say, hey, Teach us how to pray, right? We want to learn, right? And that's where the Lord's Prayer comes from. But you're absolutely right. They would not have known that. That is a prayer that Jesus creates for his church, um, and that even now, 2,000-ish years later, we still use almost every time we gather together. I thought that a lot of what he was teaching those children was what he was teaching his disciples later on, and how they were saying that it's important that they receive that as children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a, a lot of what he's teaching the children in the episode, he's going to be teaching to his disciples. Um, and he even points out some of the difficulties, right, um, that his adult disciples might have as they interact with this teaching um, that maybe the kids were able to understand a little bit easier. And again, I, I want to turn us back to Luke 10 here because I think that really gets at some of what Jesus is saying. Hear him again, verse 21. I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding 
and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, or who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And I want to point this out because this is critical to our understanding of who Jesus is and how he operates. Who does Jesus say can understand him and his ministry? No one. You're right. It's no one except who he chooses. It's actually not even children, right? Although he uses them. He says, I thank you that you've revealed this to little children. Although if you look at the context here, right, um, Jesus is actually talking about his disciples. The, the immediate thing prior to this, right, is the return of the 72. He has sent out these 72 disciples to go carry the mission, right? Um, we'll see that depicted in some way as we go. That's probably, I think that's season three. So you got a ways to wait on that, like two summers. Um, but we'll, we'll get there eventually, right? Uh, and he sends them out and they go out and they do ministry, right? They preach, they teach, they do miracles, they cast out demons, and they come back and they're all excited, right? Which probably should be, makes sense, right? And Jesus he looks up and he is filled with joy in the Holy Spirit. Sound like a good thing? It is. Jesus is happy with them too. And he says, God, I thank you that you have revealed this to little children. Notice who he's calling children. His disciples. And he's saying, you have not revealed this to the wise and to the understanding you have not revealed this to the people who have all the knowledge in the world, right? The powerful, the strong. You have revealed this to children. To those who are weak. To those who are dependent. To those who, for all intents and purposes, have nothing. Um, Elena and Wesley, I'm going to ask you this, right? Where did you get your food tonight? Where'd you get your food? From our house? Who made it for you? Mom, would you have been able to make the meal that you had tonight on your own? No, no right? <laughs> you wouldn't have been. And Jesus is making a point here, and I think the, the show creators are trying to show this too. That's okay. <laughs> In fact, that child nature, right? That, that nature that says I am dependent upon somebody else, right? Is actually helpful in the kingdom of God. Because in the kingdom of God, where's the only place that faith comes from? Jesus said it. Who is it? It's only from the Father, only from the Son, only from the Spirit, right? It is only when Jesus says, here's faith, that faith can be obtained. Nowhere else. And this actually is. This is something that Christendom really struggles with. I, I don't know the background of the show creators super well. I've looked into it a little bit, but I don't really care, honestly. Like We, we can engage in something like this uh, as Lutherans and do so very faithfully. Um, but something that Christendom really struggles with is this idea of where faith comes from. right? A lot of Christendom says faith comes from... Well, you're right. Hearing the word is right, right? That's the right answer, right? But actually, a lot of Christendom says it comes from me. I'm the one who chooses. I'm the one who believes. I'm the one who has faith. And Jesus, pretty firmly here, actually says the exact opposite. This faith has been revealed to you. This faith has been given to you in the same way that a child has been given supper. Right? It's God who does the work. It's Jesus who does the work. And it is that gift of the Spirit that continues to strengthen us as his people. Right? Um, so I think that's a, a big thing that Jesus is trying to get at, um, both within the episode and certainly within this text here in Luke chapter 10. Um, any other questions on Luke chapter 10 as it applies to the episode? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah, he, he chooses to reveal it. And, and I love, actually, throughout the episode, too, there's this wrestling with it. Um, who actually is he? Right? You, you see the kids kind of debating on their, on their walks home. Like, is he good? Is he bad? Or like, maybe he's not really who he says he is, yada, yada, yada. Um, and the Lutheran response to this, right, is this is how faith works. Jesus plants the seed of faith. Jesus gives faith. And we either have that faith that he has given to us or we reject it, right? And Jesus makes that pretty clear throughout the episode too that there's going to be people who are going to reject him and his ministry just as even still today there are going to be people who reject him. That doesn't mean we stop planting. That doesn't mean we stop watering. That doesn't mean we stop giving the goods, right, that we don't stop giving people Jesus. But at the end of the day, the sinful heart can reject Jesus. It cannot accept him. He brings his blessings into our midst. He gives us the gift, and we go from there. Again, using the example of the dinner, right? Um, my, my wife made that food for the kids. Did they do any work to receive it? No, right? It was just there for them. Could they, could they have said, we're not eating this? <laughs> and you would have said, you're being <laughs> foolish. <laughs> Right? Like you're, you're rejecting the gift, right? It, that's, that can happen, right? But like eating it isn't actually work. Does that make sense? Like it, it's just something that it's the natural thing. It's what you do when you have that gift in front of you. Um, same image with like a, a Christmas present, right? Like Elena, Wesley, um, when you see a Christmas present under the tree, what do you want to do? You want to open it, right? You, you totally want to open it. And, and that's totally natural. That's the response. Um, could you, if you wanted to, could you pick up the present and throw it out the window? <laughs> yeah, why would you do that, right? But you could. That, that's the same principle, actually, that we believe with faith, right? It, you absolutely can. You can take it. You can throw it away, right? But why? <laughs> why would you take something so beautiful, so precious, so good, and do anything other than embrace it? And cling to it with all of your strength, with all of your heart, with all of your might. Right. Yes? Well, I was thinking about people who make neat Christmas surprises. And really what that is, is in my view, Christ has called them and they're responding. Mm -hmm. no, yeah. They, they're making it. I mean, I believe in deathbed confessions and all this too. But oh, yeah, I do too. I, yeah. I, I, and again. But God still initiates. So yes. And, and, and even more so than God initiating, like we would say, hey, you're saying that you're making the decision, but ultimately it's Christ who's chosen you, right? Um, and we would look at Scripture and we would say, hey, this is just what Scripture says, right? Again and again. Um, truthfully, as I read Scripture, and again, I would say this is a Lutheran, so like there, there's that bias granted. I, I find the idea of double predestination, right, to be way more convincing scripturally than I find the idea of decision theology, right? Um, I, I don't think double predestination is right. And, and again, maybe I'm using too technical of a term, right? Um, so when we talk about, like, so all of this is the, like, theological term for what we're talking about is election, okay? Um, so, like, we're in an election year, right, where we're going to choose our president, right? Um, th that's the same principle here. This is the idea of how are people elected, how are people chosen for faith, right? Um, and it's a, a really big question, and there's really three answers, right? So the one is decision, which says that at least in some way, shape, or form, right, like, I make the decision. Now, even, even the most ardent, nah, maybe not the most ardent, but e most decision theologians, most people who fall in this category, they would say, yeah, Jesus does a goodly chunk of the work, right? So maybe he does 95% of the work, but I still have to do the other 5%, right? And I have to do the, that work of accepting him, okay? Um, the second option is what I just said is like double predestination. And, and double predestination says, well, Scripture pretty clearly says that God does 100% of the work of choosing, right? So God does 100% of the work of, you're not going to be able to get on the screen, you're too short. Thank you, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
God does 100% of the work uh, of choosing who is saved, right? Which a Lutheran agrees with. But they would also say that God does then 100% of the work of choosing who is not saved. So if somebody is condemned to hell, it's because God chose that. Okay? Um, whereas Lutherans, and maybe a couple others, but Lutherans are, are truthfully kind of the biggest one on this. Uh, that's not true. Catholics, I would say, probably also fall here. Um, do kind of the single predestination thing. where we say it's 100% God that we are chosen, um, but then it's paradoxically 100% man when we are not chosen. So it's our fault when we don't believe, but it's only God's responsibility when we do believe. And again, I know the math doesn't check out there. Like You could run this math a billion times and it's never going to work because it's a paradox, right? But... It's a paradox that we believe Scripture teaches. Right? Because if I, if I recite a verse for you, God desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Right? That's Scripture. Right? God wants everybody to be saved, so does God want anybody to be condemned? No. And that's clear again and again when we read the Scriptures. Right? You could go even back into the Old Testament. In Ezekiel chapter 18, God says, I desire the death of no one. I don't desire the death of anyone, so repent and live, right? Fix it, right? So God does not desire people to be condemned. It is our, unfortunately, sinful condition that leads to condemnation. And Luther actually looked at this, and he calls it the bondage of the will, um, where Luther actually says, at least in this, which is kind of the biggest thing, uh, we don't have free will. And I know that maybe isn't something we like to hear because we like the idea of free will, and to a degree we do. Um, I chose to wear an orange shirt today, right? Like, God didn't make me wear an orange shirt today. I chose to wear an orange shirt today. That's fine. But when it comes to salvation, this is something where Luther says, nope, guess who chose Zach? God. Because my only choice, the only choice that my sinful heart can do is to rebel. And, and I know this is maybe a little bit heady, a little bit weighty for our, our discussion on children, um, but when we look at Luke chapter 10, I do think that's what Jesus is trying to get at as he talks about this idea of election. And I know people in, in Texas, Colorado. Mm -hmm. You know, now there's another thing, so who knows who's going to take it away? Yeah, and, and, and even within that, though, like what Lutherans don't believe, right? What we don't believe is we don't believe that there was some small spark in us that God saw and said, oh, Zach is going to believe, right? So I'm going to give him faith. We actually believe that God looked at Zach and said, Zach is a miserable, rotten sinner, right? Without any merit or worthiness in him, he is totally, woefully inadequate for everything that I have for him. I'm going to give it to him anyway. Right? Um, and so within that context, and, and this is, like, th this problem of election um, is often referred to as, like, the cross of the theologian, um, which, fun fact for the day, what's a theologian? What's a theologian? Somebody who studies God. So who's a theologian in this room? Oh, all of us, right, right. Um, it, it's called the cross of the theologian because it's the question that every person who studies the Bible, every person who really studies Jesus wrestles with and comes up against, and there's no real satisfying answer, right? Even Paul, actually, the, the longest discussion on it is in Romans 9 through 11, um, where Paul spends a lot of time talking both about the Jewish nation and the Gentiles and about how God has done the work of choosing, right? Um, and Paul basically just throws up his hand and says, hey, we're clay pots. Why are we going to talk back to God and say this isn't fair? Paul says, you can't, right? All we can do is trust, and all we can do is go out and do the electing, right? There's a world out there that needs to know who Jesus is, so it's our job to go out and let Jesus plant the seed and do the work, right? Sorry, extended talk on Luke 10. I wasn't really planning on going here, but it is what it is. All right, let's turn to Matthew 18.
All right, so this is Matthew chapter 18, starting with verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And so again, this is one of those famous passages where we get this understanding of childlike faith, right? Um, so what lesson is Jesus trying to teach with these words? In other words, how is he encouraging us to live like children? Um, what other lessons can we learn from the children in this episode and from young people in our lives too? Um, Elena and Wesley, I have a special question for you at the end, but we'll get there, okay? Um, so what do you think? As we watch this episode together, as we engage in this word from Matthew 18, um, what's Jesus teaching us about how we're supposed to be childlike? Humble. What does that mean? Humble. Humble. That, that's the word that he uses, right? And it is absolutely the first one that should come to our mind, humility. Um, now, inquisitive. inquisitive, yep, that's definitely something we see in the episode, right? <laughs> and we, we see this little girl who asks eight billion questions. We've all known kids like that, right? Um, and sometimes it makes us smile. A lot of the times it may be, well, it kind of depends on whose child it is, right? Um, sometimes when it's our child, we're like, dude, just stop, right? Um, and, and I think this is an encouragement that says, hey, an inquisitive mind is a good mind, right? And we want to encourage that. I, I love that Jesus says at the end of the episode, I hope my students ask the same questions you did, right? Because we ought to be asking questions of this Jesus. We ought to be. Child, you know, he was, it was, it was just, it was, it was just, I, and I see the struggle in him. <laughs> yeah, that no. About other things too, but that, that joy uh, of discovery, and even actually, I think that joy is, is something that tends to be characteristic of kids um, in a way that we probably should learn from. It, it's kind of like this. Um, Elena Wesley, you guys listening? You ready? All right, let's say that we walked outside and all of a sudden the temperature had dropped considerably and it had snowed six inches when we left the room. What would you guys want to do with the snow? You'd want to play in it, right? Elena, do you agree? Would you want to play in the snow? What, what might you play in the snow? What, what might you want to do? You want to make snowballs? Have a snowball fight? That'd be pretty fun. Wesley, something else? Snowball fight with the window. Snowball fight with the window, even. Yeah, we like to throw snowballs at the window. Snowball fight with the window. Oh, I remember that time when I was inside and the guards were trying to get snowballs inside and hit me. Yep, I remember that too. Yep, right? For the rest of us, if it suddenly dropped 50 degrees, 60 degrees, whatever, right? And we walked outside and there were six inches of snow on the ground, what would we be thinking? Yeah, right? Um, and granted, granted, I know that sometimes um, there are physical limitations, right, that, that start to be a real impact. Um, but I actually think that speaks to some of what's going on here, which is that I think for a lot of kids, Sin hasn't beat them down in the same way that it has for a lot of us. And, and I mean, sometimes that's even physical, right? Like, why do you hurt when you get older? <laughs> the body doesn't move the right way. Why does your body not move the right way any longer? Because it's old. Maybe it wasn't taken care of. It's actually because you're a sinner. I mean, I don't mean that meanly, right? Like, that's true of me, too. Like, I'm, gonna, I'm, 
unfortunately, right, and maybe this is more of a, I didn't treat my body, right? Um, but I already have a knee that's like a weather vane for me, right? Like I know when the pressure changes are coming in already because my right knee doesn't like it, right? Like there's too much fluid in there. It rotates, like does all that weird stuff that pressure changes do, right? Uh, anybody else have like a, a knee that tells the weather for you? Whole body that does. Whole body that does? Yeah, 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 right? Um, that's, I, I hate to say it, that's the effect of sin, right? Sin is ultimately what causes our bodies to break down and decay. That's it. Without sin, that doesn't happen. Without sin, you and I are youthful forever, perfect. Yeah, whatever that might mean, right? Um, I, I said this once um, where somebody asked me, like, what age are we going to be when we're in heaven? I don't know if this was here or in my previous congregation now that I'm thinking about it. What, what age are we going to be when we're in heaven? And I'm like, I'm not actually sure. I think we're going to be adults, but we're going to act like kids. <laughs> And I thought that was a great answer. And my wife was like, that was so vague, Zach. That was horrible. Like, what are, what are you even saying, right? Um, and, but I, I stand by it, right? Because I think that there's something about it. And we all sense it. Actually, even non-Christians sense it, right? Like, when, when you're interacting with kids, you sense that, like, joy, that vigor, right? That excitement, whatever it might be. They don't even have to be Christian kids, right? But there's something in them yet that hasn't been beaten down by sin. It's not that they're not sinful already. They are already very, very sinful. Um, it, you know, I, I find it always interesting when parents are like, oh, my kid is so innocent. They're, they're so precious. I'm like, that's true. I'm like, but man, I knew my kids were sinful after like two days, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> it doesn't take very long. Um, that sin is a part of them, right? It just is. And it's already affecting them. It's already impacting them. And there are kids who have been beaten down by both their own sin and the sin of the world around them. But it hasn't hit them the same way that it has us after we've lived with it for however long, right? 30 years, 60 years, take your pick. Um, and one of the things that really struck me about this was actually a C.S. Lewis novel. Um, I was reading this. It's part of his space trilogy, um, and it takes place on Earth. And he mentions this idea that, you know, we've kind of like trained ourselves to hate weather. <laughs> you talk to any kid, it's raining, what do they want to do? <laughs> They want to go splash in the puddle, right? Yeah. And actually, if you look at most creation, most creation is kind of the same way, right? Like, what does a dog want to do with a puddle? <laughs> Trapes all over through it, right? And like splash and then shake off the water, right? Like, creation just does this naturally. Creation embraces the weather. Who are the only people that don't? <laughs> the people old enough to know better? <laughs> And, and I read that I was very convicted. And so ever since then, I've been really like, if it snows, I'm going to get out there with my kids and I'm going to play in the snow, right? If it's raining, I'm going to go splash in some puddles, right? Because why not, <laughs> right? I, I think that speaks to some of this idea of, right, hey, the truth of the matter has been revealed to little children. Um, it's the wise and the understanding who have kind of taught themselves something that maybe isn't as helpful. And again, I, I recognize physical limitations. So like, I'm not going to name any names. There might be some of you who I would not recommend go sledding, right? Like, it might not be, might, might not be your cup of tea anymore, right? I, I'm not going to name any names, okay? Um, and that's okay, right? But there is still joy to be had, right? And, and I hope that we can find ways to live that out regardless of our age. Gloria, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah. Yeah, and it could be. Yeah, obviously, we, we believe that Adam and Eve are made as a perfect and as adults, uh, whatever that looks like. Um, there are actually a lot of, a lot of Hebrew scholars um, believe that it's day one that the fall happens, um, that, that, there's, that it happens right away. Uh, obviously, we don't know that. Like, it doesn't say in the text, so we can't pick that out. Um, but yeah, you're, you're right. I, I think as we look at it, there's something about us, right, that Jesus is saying, hey, when you're an adult, you've lost sight of something that you kind of want. And you've probably, I, I hope you all have, I hope you all have met adults who kind of live this out. I mean, I hope for all of us that there are still times where, like, we embrace that childlike nature, um, even if it's not, like, explicitly related to the faith. 
Um, it, it's a good thing to have joy and peace. Yes. I know. Daddy's boring. <laughs> I know. I know. Someday you'll get there. So, <laughs> right? Um, and nevertheless, though, there are, and here's the thing. Like, this is what's so amazing about the body of Christ, right? Elena and Wesley, there are things that Jesus is saying we have to learn from you. Explicitly, Jesus just said that. Jesus is saying, we're supposed to look at you guys, right? We're supposed to watch you, and we're supposed to learn from you, okay? He says that, and he means it. And, and frankly, I'm sure you all have had that experience where you've been interacting with a child, and you've been able to learn from them. It's why, even with this, that's probably a little bit more adult-oriented, when my kids want to come, I'm like, yep, come on over, right? Uh, you might be bored for a little bit, but whatever, right? It, it's good for you to be here. It's good for you to be an example to us of faith. But by the same token, and Jesus said this in the episode, I should say the actor who played Jesus said this in the episode, but regardless, right? Like, do my kids know everything? No, right? And that's okay. They don't know everything about Scripture. I think they know a decent amount about Scripture, especially for their age, which is awesome. I'm, I'm blessed by that, right? But they don't know everything. Guess who else doesn't know everything? Y'all, right? Uh, their, their layabout father, right? Like, he doesn't know everything, right? And so there's this constant act of learning, and they need to learn from us, right? They need to be listening and growing and learning from our wisdom, right? It, it's this wonderful balancing act that we all get to do together where we all have to say we are humble enough to acknowledge we need more Jesus. We need more growth. We need more faith. Jesus, give it to us. Right. Other thoughts on Matthew 18 or on what we saw in the episode? Um, I, I am going to ask one more question. I said I was going to do this, and I really actually want to do it because I'm curious what your answers are going to be. Elena, Wesley, um, this is a, a question for you. You guys are young people. True or false? True. I, I would agree with you. Um, what kind of example can you set? Like, what do you think we're supposed to learn from you? How can we better learn from you guys as kids, especially kids of faith? Because do you guys believe in Jesus? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty confident in that. I, I heard the yes, right? I heard them both. So what can we learn from you? What do you think? How do you set an example for us about faith? No. What it, well, how about this? I'll ask it a different way. What are things that you do that make Jesus happy? What are things that you two do that make Jesus happy? Can I explain my toys? When you're taking care of your little siblings the way that you're supposed to, especially when mommy and daddy ask you, yeah? Respecting our mom and dad. Respecting our mom and dad, respecting our authority, yeah? Those are, those are good things. Those are obviously things that we typically see in our house. What about all them? <laughs> <laughs> it's not that they're, uh, obviously, some of them have been in our house, right? Like, we, we've been with some of them before. But, like, what are things that you can do that they can see that make Jesus happy? What do you think? What are you doing right now? You're listening? What are you listening to? What are we doing together? What book are we studying? The Bible. The Bible, right? So we can learn from you just in your presence here. Um, on Sunday mornings, when we come to church, do you guys ever sing? Yeah. We can learn from your voice, from your singing. 
I actually got to experience that the other day, obviously. Do I get to sit with you guys often in the pew? No, right, because I'm normally working, right? So when I was at the, our, when we went to church together, I got to hear one of my kids, um, she came over and sat on my lap, and she was singing with me as we were singing through the liturgy, right? Um, and guess who was a really, like, happy father hearing that little voice, right? Because I got to hear her, and I got to learn from her, right? I don't know if she knows all the words that she was singing. She sang them really well. <laughs> But it doesn't really matter if she sang it well, poorly, or whatever. Like, just her presence and her lifting up her voice, that was something that we got to learn from. So keep on setting good examples for us, okay? You guys are doing a good job. I want to I see you guys keep that up. All right, Matthew chapter 10. Super quick. Yes, ma'am. All right, this is going to seem like a weird passage for us to look at together, especially after the episode. Um, the, the line that really made me think about it was in this episode, Jesus tells the children that he will be dangerous to some, but not to you. Okay, that's kind of a weird line um, that Jesus offers, but it's true. And, and what I want to do here is I want to look at these hard words of Jesus. Like the words we're going to look at are really, really hard. Um, frankly, they are words that make us really uncomfortable as Christians because our typical depiction of Jesus tends to be a lot like what we saw in the episode. At, at least I think that's how we normally picture him. We normally picture him as very gentle, as very loving. He's both of those things, okay? Um, but there is an aspect of Jesus that is dangerous. There just is. And, and we see that in these words, and I just kind of want to talk about that a little bit. Um, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So as you think about these words in Matthew chapter 10, as you think about that line in the episode, how do these words reflect that danger? And is there at all a disconnect between the Jesus of this episode and the Jesus who speaks these difficult words? Um, as you think about those words, what do they mean to us? How do we balance these words of Jesus in our lives? What's Jesus saying? He's saying he should be number one. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that alone is going to cause division, mm -hmm. right? Uh, there's, there's no getting around it, and, and Jesus says it very clearly here, and I, I think it's what he's alluding to in the episode as well. Jesus causes division. I can't avoid that. With Jesus, you're either in or you're out. And now the great thing is, like, if you're even the smallest bit in, if you have even faith the size of a mustard seed, right, mm -hmm. you can say to this mountain, get up and move. How many of you feel comfortable doing that? <laughs> what does that say about the size of our faith? <laughs> Probably not even the size of a mustard seed, and yet we're saved. Because Jesus has chosen us, because he's called us, he's brought us into his kingdom, right? But there are lots of people who are not. I would wager that for most of us, there are even people in our lives that we love dearly who we are not sure what their faith is like. And it scares us. It stresses us out. It makes us sad. It makes us angry. There are all sorts of emotions attached to it. Uh, but ultimately, I think the biggest one probably is fear because we recognize the reality of Jesus' words that you are either in or you're out. And that scares us because we love these people. But rightly, 
We love Jesus more. Jesus does bring division. There is danger associated with that. And of course, we don't have to deal with this nearly as much, but oftentimes that faith leads to even physical danger, e even death. Right? That is a reality for lots of our Christian brothers and sisters, for lot, lots of them throughout history. We are, we are blessed. We don't really have to deal with that. A at most... <laughs> At most, I'd say most of us have to deal with maybe like a little bit of petty, like mockery. I'd say at most, that's what we've dealt with. Maybe some of us have experienced something a little bit more than that, but I'd say for most of us, that's probably the extent. Hold on just a second, sweetie, okay? I'll be right there, All right? But there are Christians who are in danger because of their faith. And Jesus says, that person is blessed. Blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake. For so too they persecuted your fathers before you. Right? And by the same token, Jesus also reminds us, whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. He is saying there's something about us that needs to be left behind so that we can really understand who he is and what he's done. Yes? Yeah, I, I couldn't look at the numbers to tell you for sure. That wouldn't surprise me. Um, the, for, the, for the video, the, the comment was that Pastor Peters pointed out that more people have died uh, on account of their faith in the last 100 years than any other time in history. Um, that's entirely possible. Um, a, there's more people in the world now than there have ever been, right? So like, there, there's that factor. Um, B, there were some regimes in... in the world that have been particularly hostile to Christianity in the last hundred years. Um, one of the ones that comes immediately to mind is, is the Soviet Union, USSR. Um, but yeah, there, there are always Christians being persecuted, and there always will be. I, I don't think that's changing. Um, frankly, it's not always a bad thing for the church. I know that's hard for us as we sit in our comfortable air-conditioned room um, and do have the blessing of getting to gather together like this. Um, but a lot of the times with the church, comfort breeds just apathy. Um, and, and I think sometimes that discomfort, that struggle, that strife, it really helps us to see just how important Christ really is. You've probably seen that just in kind of some of the periods of strife in your own life, right? When we're struggling with something, I'd wager we're far more likely to fall down to our knees and pray um, than when everything is just kind of sailing the way it's supposed to. Not always, but that is a is a very easy sinful temptation to fall into. Right. And one of our members and participants in the class who isn't here tonight, Dutch, is moving his family away, and they won't want anything to do with him because he's claimed Christ as his savior and tried to share it with them, and they just no way. Yeah. Yeah. You want to talk about? Man against his father, daughter against her mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. That really does happen, right? It does. Um, still to this day, still where we live, th there are people who wrestle with that and have to deal with it. So we should not take these words lightly. Um, and I will say, this is one of the things that I struggle a little bit with, um, with the depiction of Jesus and the chosen. Um, I, I, I generally really, really love it. And like I said, this is one of my favorite episodes. But I think there is a sense at times where we maybe don't quite capture just the danger um, that's associated with him. Like, he is loving, he is gentle, um, but in the words of C.S. Lewis, he's not a tame lion, right? Like, Jesus is not some... <laughs> he is your friend, so I don't want you to take this the wrong way. But it's not like he's just somebody, right, that we call up when we want to talk and it's fine, right? Like, he's the king. He's the Lord. He's the ruler of all things, right? Um, and sometimes I think, and I, I had read this critique as well, 
like you see John the baptizer, we'll get there as we go through season one, like you see John the baptizer and he's depicted as crazy, right? That's how people looked at Jesus too. <laughs> like they saw Jesus and they saw a crazy, like dangerous, I mean, they saw him as a heretic, right? They, they saw him as this crazy, dangerous blasphemer who was going to ruin their kingdom. Like he was dangerous. And, and I'm not sure that's always depicted quite as well as it could be. And, and he's certainly forceful too, right? Like, Jesus doesn't just look at us and be like, oh, like, just do whatever the heck you want to do, right? Mm. Jesus has very specific rules and, and statements about how we're supposed to live. Well, even his brother, James, he came together because he was upset with John. Yeah, yeah. Um, all of his siblings, uh, and, and his mother is there as well, um, which Catholics don't like, but I, What's that? I said Catholics don't love that because... Mary's there as part of the crew to like say like, hey, why don't you tone it back a bit? Um, or at least that's how I think you have to read that story, but whatever. Any other thoughts on this? All right. Yeah. He does, right? Whether it really happened or not. Yeah, it, it almost certainly yeah, didn't. Yeah. A bit, right? I know, no, it's a great, I do actually think it's a beautiful way for us to be really introduced to Jesus. Like we've seen him, but we, he's only had like five minutes of screen time tops so far before this episode, right? This is where we really get to see him. And, and I think it is a great way to depict him, to see him um, as this great teacher, right? But even more than that, as this person who is here for us. He's there for those kids. He brings them joy. He has joy with them, right? Like he is, he feels blessed to get to teach and minister to them. And it's the same way with all of us, right? Even in the midst of our stubbornness, even in the midst of our struggles, even in the midst of those days where maybe we're like, are we sure this dude isn't a murderer, right? Like he loves us and he wants us there, right? This is who he is. It's what he does. He embraces us. He humbles us. And he calls us to be his children. And what a great blessing that is. It's an awesome first way to see him. What age did Jesus start his ministry? We, we believe about 30. Um, up in the air a little bit. but could have run into some kids. Oh, certainly. We, we know he runs into kids in his ministry. We absolutely know he runs into kids in his ministry. Yeah. And, and it's possible, it seems unlikely that this would be like where he first announces his messiahship, um, just based off of what we read in scripture. But it, it's certainly, if, and this is how I try to interact with all of the like insertions, right? Because all of these insertions, like, there's a number of insertions throughout the episodes, right? My, my always like question is, if Jesus met people like this, is this how he would act? And I think in this episode, the answer is 100% yes, right? Like, if Jesus ran into this motley crew of six children, right, this is 100% uh, how he would act. Um, and I, I will say, too, my favorite thing about this episode is that it's so unnecessary. And, and what I mean by that, nothing Jesus does for these kids is in any way, shape, or form necessary. Like, Abigail comes from a healthy home, right? She's loved, she's cared for, she's cherished. Um, she, she does not need, like, these toys at the end. But Jesus does it because he loves her. <laughs> That's who he is. That's what he does. And, and I will say, one of the things I don't like is I don't like that they make Simon so desperate to have this miracle happen. Because I actually think it's way better that Jesus just does it. <laughs> Simon had a bad night fishing. Eh, not that big of a deal. Oh, Simon, cast out your net one more time. <laughs> Jesus gives us so many things that we don't need. <laughs> Still to this day, so many things we don't need. And yet, of course, he also gives us that which is most essential, salvation. And that's why I love this episode. I love it. It's totally unnecessary, and yet it's good. I know it's kind of cool, too, the way... You know, this little toy, they, they made her, she made her an, an angel. 
Yeah, yeah. It is, it is, yeah, that, that, that you see this manger depicted. Yep, it is. It's a, it's a beautiful episode um, that does reflect, I think, the great beauty uh, of our Savior. Um, and that's maybe not a super masculine word, but it should be. Like, we, we have a beautiful Savior, and what a blessing it is. And what a joy you could see in his expression mm -hmm. as those kids were reciting his words. Yeah. And, and he was just listening and just taking it all in and then even repeating some of the words himself. Yep. That's so cool. Yep, it is. It's really cool. All right. You have to think about the power of the uh, yeah, the 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 whole show really is centered around that idea, right? Uh, of how Jesus chooses his disciples, I and mean, how he is the chosen one, the Messiah that we all need. All right. Well, with that, I bid you all a fond farewell. Have a wonderful evening. We'll see you again next week.